Well, we are in Numbers, and we want to highlight Numbers chapter 7, 8, and 9 tonight. We look when leaders give, when servants serve, and also when the Lord leads our life. And so we first look as the tabernacle has been built, it's been put together, and we want to learn some spiritual lessons along the way. In chapter 7, it's the longest book in the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. It's actually the second longest chapter in the entire Bible. Uh, the longest chapter in the Bible, everybody knows, is Psalm 119, okay? And uh, it has like 176 verses. It's, you know, massive uh, chapter. All about the Word of God. The, it's incredible. Well, this is, has 89 verses, chapter 7, but it's all about giving. And so if the number one chapter in the Bible, or the largest chapter, is about God's Word, the second longest chapter is about the generosity of these leaders that give here in this passage of Scripture. And we're just going to look at the first 17 verses because then it becomes repetitious. Every All 12 tribes on 12 days, kind of like 12 days of Christmas, but they have their 12 days of giving. In succession, each day, the tribes go through the process to uh, give to the work of the Lord. And, you know, there's just something that not only in leadership, but in our life with the Lord, that, uh, you know, D.L. Moody used to joke that the last thing that's converted on a person is their wallet. And I've observed that to be true. When, when the Lord finally gets a hold of somebody's heart and mind, and also he becomes the Lord of their finances, where they begin to honor him. And we see that picture in this passage of scripture. And we might be challenged just in our own life. Uh, are we generous with the things of the Lord? Have, has the Lord begin to touch us that as we give to his work and to his kingdom, he says that we can't take our money with us, but we can store it up in heaven. Meaning that when we give to God's work, it's like investing in Wall Street, but a heavenly Wall Street that doesn't crash and you don't lose half your money. You actually, it's, you can send it ahead and your reward is going to be there, that your treasure is there, like a bank account is there. And when somebody finally makes, makes that connection and that realization then it really transforms their life. And then they discover the generosity of a life of giving. It's just really exciting. In verse 1 it says, Now it came to pass when Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle, so they've got it built, that he anointed it and consecrated it and all its furnishings and the altar and all its utensils, so he anointed them and consecrated them. Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of their father's houses, who were the leaders of the tribes and over those who were numbered, made an offering. That's what this whole chapter is about, the offering that they made. Verse 3, and they brought their offering before the Lord. Notice that this offering is going to be given to Moses, Aaron, to the priests and the Levites, but it is before the Lord. Ultimately, all of our giving to the work of the Lord is before the Lord. The Lord sees it. And it tells us in verse 3, six covered carts, 12 oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders, and for each one an ox. And they presented them before the tabernacle. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, accept these from them, that they may be used in doing the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall give them to the Levites, to every man according to his service." So the first part of this gift that is given here, as we see, there's six covered carts and 12 oxen. And so uh, this is going to be now used for the Levites who have to, remember the, the tabernacle is a tent with actually a, even a portable fence that's around it. Uh, it's 150 feet long, it's 75 feet wide, and they're going to take this thing down and they're going to be moving all the time. So they're going to need these carts. Notice what it says here in verse 7. Two carts and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service. And four carts and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari according to their service under the authority of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. But the sons of Kohath he gave none because theirs was the service of the holy things which they carried on their shoulders. The Kohathites, they carried the five pieces of article. They carried the Ark of the Covenant. They carried the menorah, the candle uh, stick. They carried the table of showbread, the table of incense. And as uh, they're carrying these implements, these um, uh, things, they would have poles through them and they carried them on their shoulders. But Gershon gets two carts and four oxen, but the uh, Merari, that tribe, or that clan, I should say, they get four carts and eight oxen because they have all of the posts 
and all of the sockets. So they have a lot larger load, and so that's what they get. But I think it's good, as we think about people giving generously, even as you look at this, there are three groups of people. One group doesn't get anything because they're supposed to carry the things on their shoulder. And the other, there's a, a disparagement or a difference. They get four carts, they get two carts. Now, you never have any giving and receiving where it's noticed publicly where people don't get bent out of shape when there's an inequity. Hey, they got four carts, we got two carts. Do you have children? Can you hear it now? How come he got a bigger helping of spaghetti than me? You ever given your children a candy bar? Now split this candy bar. Oh, two of them. You got to figure out the art though. There's a couple of things that diffuse tensions between two children. One is, is that you allow the one to divide and the other one gets to choose. That means it is down to the millimeter. Okay, you always, this is the easy way to do it. One gets to divide it, the other one gets to choose. That, they're, they're getting out the tape measure, they're just getting right down to it. Um, the other thing is, is that if you have a choice, well, who does this, who does that? You know, the Bible says that casting lots separates the mighty. We would say flipping a coin separates the mighty. Hey, who's going to go first? Who's going to get this? Who's, you went first, whatever. You don't know. So, hey, let's just flip a coin. It diffuses everything. Because you flip a coin, it's 50-50, right? It's fair in most people's world. It wasn't fair in my son and daughter's because my daughter never loses. <laughs> Caleb always lost. So even to this day, if I say, hey, let's flip a coin, he goes, no, thanks, don't want to do it. <laughs> Jesse always wins. But when you look at this, on a big scale, for the children of Israel, these, these carts that are separated because the workload of Merari is much heavier. And so they get more equipment. I think in our life that so often we lose a lot of joy when God, our Father in heaven, distributes different resources to different people in the kingdom and people compare. We look at people that are more blessed than us. We look at people that are more prosperous than us. We look at they got, they got twice as many carts as us. They have this or that. And, you know, Paul told the Corinthians that when you compare yourself with yourselves, you're just not wise if God has blessed somebody else with twice as much as I have, then they must have the need or they must have the ability to manage it. And he didn't give me that because I don't have the ability to manage that or I don't have that need. And to be relaxed in that place, but all through life, you're gonna find that not only do you see it with your kids, but even adults, they have a problem with when from their perception, there's some inequity in the generosity that takes place. You know, when I think about people that struggle with this, and I see that the joy that it robs, that's why it's such an emphasis in the Bible that godliness with contentment's great gain. If you have food and clothes, be content. If you have food and covering, I mean, really, what else do you need? You have food, you have clothes, place to sleep. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's in Bel Air or it's in a shack. It's, I mean, you still, just food and clothes. One person wears one set of clothes. You can have one meal, you have a bed. And we live in such a land of plenty that there's so much comparison that, that, that people have a hard time. Oftentimes in church, maybe a poor brother or sister, they're struggling as they look at somebody that's really affluent and they're bummed out about that. And uh, it's kind of hard on them. You know, Peter had a hard time comparing. He wanted to compare when Jesus told him in the last chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, He's talking very directly to him. He, he reaffirms him. He asks him three times in Peter if he, he loves him. And Peter says, yes, you know, I'm fond of you and this and that. And at the end, the Lord tells him, Peter, he says, Peter, when you're young, you dress yourself. You went wherever you want, but went wherever you want. But when you're old, somebody else is going to clothe you and they're going to take you to a place you don't want and they're going to stretch out your arms and you're going to die. He was saying to Peter, Peter, he was prophesying. He was telling Peter, in your future, Peter, you're going to be crucified just like me. I would rather not know that detail. I'd just rather, you know, show up, oh, wow, it's a cross. Well, wow, they're going to nail me to the cross. But for years wondering, you know, but as soon as Jesus told Peter, you know what Jesus' plan for Peter was in the future? The cross. Do you know that some of us, God's plan for us is really different than the person sitting next to you? But do you know it's nanya, nanya business? what God's plan is for the person next to you. All you can do is surrender your heart to God. 
The Lord told Peter, he said, when you're old, you're going to die on a cross like me. Traditionally, Peter went to the cross. And he said, I'm not, counted worth, I, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And so he, you know, was crucified upside down, according to church tr tradition. It's not in the Bible. But as soon as Jesus said that, he told Peter, this is what your future looks like, Peter. Peter turned and he looked at John and he said, what about him? Aren't we that way? <laughs> what about him? And Jesus said, what's that to you if I leave him till I come again? That's none of your business. Remember? None of you. None, none of your business. If I leave him. And therefore, actually, a rumor started because Jesus said, what's that to you if I leave him until I come again? So a rumor went around that John, before John died, Jesus would come again because of that rumor. He said, no, you don't worry about it, but you follow me. In suffering and in blessing and in ge generosity and in need, Jesus is still the Lord of our life. And if you want to be miserable, just compare your lot in life to somebody else's lot in life and watch how you are discouraged. Well, actually, two things happen. If you have a better lot in life than the person sitting in front of you or behind you, then you get a little proud, like, wow, I got a better lot than they do. And if you have a worse one, you're bummed out, like, oh, how come they have a better one than me? I love the generosity, but I've, I've noticed that what it brings out in people. In this whole passage, now the, the 12 uh, tribes bring all of their offerings each day. And it tells us in verse 12 through 17, this is the first day. We're only going to read that one because then it's uh, redundant and, and it, it all, um, all the other 11 tribes follow. It says in verse 12, and the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab from the tribe of Judah. His offering was one silver platter, the weight of which was 130 shekels and one silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, one gold pan of 10 shekels full of incense, one young bull, one ram, one male lamb in its first year as a burnt offering, one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, uh, and a partridge and a pear tree, and five male lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Aminadab of Judah, the tribe of Judah. So now every uh, every one of the tribes, the other 11, their offering is exactly the same. They did it each day for 12 days. And you say, well, why record that? Why record the redundancy? Because if you understand God's heart and the perspective of giving, that God wants to chronicle and acknowledge all of their gifts because that's important to him. Do you know that the Lord is a, uh, a great record keeper? He, he's someone who keeps track, you will not lose your reward. Even if it gets down to a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, he says, by no means will you lose your reward. You remember the widow that put in the, the two mites? And Jesus said, this woman put in more than those who had, were putting in larger value uh, sums because she put in all she had and the Lord took notice. You don't give one penny or one million dollars and anything in between that the Lord doesn't notice and it's being recorded in heaven. Just like we have the second longest chapter in the Bible recording all of their gifts because God takes note when his people with generosity are a part of his work in his kingdom and are storing up their treasures in heaven. Well, it goes on to explain that, and it also gives the sum totals of the 12 tribes. They give something like 252 animals, a lot between the 12 tribes. But in the very last verse of this chapter, leaders not only are generous at the beginning, but leaders that hear the voice of the Lord, specifically Moses. It says in verse 89, Now when Moses went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. Thus he spoke to him. Moses, and, and you're going to see it because we're going to get to it in numbers. The Lord says, you know, um, prophets, I speak to them kind of in dreams or in visions or vaguely. But God chose to speak to Moses like a man speaks to his friend. He says face to face, but we know they don't speak face to face because Moses asked to see the Lord's face and the Lord told him, Moses, you can't look on my face and live. You'll die. But think about how Moses now is in the place to hear from God. Do you know that you have a great opportunity in your walk with the Lord to hear from him? When you read the Bible, God is talking to you. 
Do you understand at Moses' time, though he was writing the first five books of the Bible, there was no Bible. There was no Bible. And so God speaking to Moses audibly and the patriarchs before that ministering to them in such a way that as he's speaking to them audibly, if you will, face to face or as a friend does to a friend, I've never had the Lord speak to me audibly. Um, my calling was quite radical and it seemed the Lord, you know, speaks to like puts thoughts and impressions in your mind. And, you know, the loudest I ever heard the Lord speak to me or have a thought go through my mind was his call to me to go into the ministry. As a matter of fact, it was so distinct, though it wasn't an audible voice, it was a room full of men at a men's retreat. The Lord said, you're going into full-time ministry. And, and I was so startled, it was so powerful in my life that I remember turning and looking at the guy behind me because I actually thought I was overhearing the Lord speaking to someone else, not me. I was thinking the Lord... You don't, you don't want me. Surely the guy behind me has got something going on <laughs> that would be good or, you know, we could offer for service. But when we read the Bible, God's talking to you. People tell me, God's not, God's not talking to me. I said, that's ridiculous. You've got a Bible, right? When I read the Bible, God's talking to me. That's the word of the Lord. That's why people that never read their Bible... They can honestly say God's not talking to them. Can God speak to us through thoughts and impressions in our hearts and our minds? Yes, he can. And I've had the Lord direct me a number of times with thoughts and impressions, but not an audible voice. When I pray, I'm pouring my heart out and I'm talking to the Lord. That's what you call a relationship. When you talk with one another, when God talks to you through his word, and then you talk to him through prayer, that's what you call a relationship. Husbands and wives, when you talk to each other, that's called a relationship. You should try it. And... Uh, uh, you know, sometimes the husband's the strong, silent type. He doesn't have anything to say, you know, since the marriage day that, except uh-huh and uh-uh. And uh, kind of reduced to one, one syllable type of thing. But the Lord uh, wants to communicate with us. And Moses here, he hears him above the mercy seat. He's in the ta tabernacle, uh, tabernacle. It appears that Moses could go into the Holy of Holies. Only Aaron, the high priest, could go in once a year. But for Moses, because he's just unique to this, this transition from coming out of Egypt, that it appears that Moses was able to uh, go right before the Lord all the time and communicate with him as this intercessor, as this leader. And he wanted to hear from God. And you know, as we've shared before, that as he spent time with the Lord, his face began to radiate with the glory of God, and then it would begin to dim or fade. And so he would put a veil over his face to, um, so the people couldn't see it fading away. And you and I, with unveiled faces, according to 2 Corinthians 3.18, can behold, as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord and be changed from glory to glory. You have as much of God talking to you as you want. As much as you want to hear from him. I would just encourage you to get in some structured habit of reading through the Bible. People tell me, well, you know, I do this. I just wake up in the morning and I just kind of flop it open. See, where it, where, where, wherever it falls open, that's their style. It's kind of a hit and miss thing. They flop it open and they read, Judas went out and hung himself. Well, that's not a good verse to the, the day, you know, so they flip it again. Go do likewise. That's not good. <laughs> you know, and, and you, you wouldn't go down to the store and buy a novel and flop it open like that for six months, reading a page or a paragraph or a sentence, and expect to get the story. You, you just wouldn't. And I find that people, uh, God, there's a method to God's communication. It's an integrated message system. That's why we lead our staff. We lead everybody. We have a, a, a piece of paper you can get. Just start reading through the Bible in a year. Most, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but most people that trust the Word of God, that it is the Word of God, and it has the answers for actually eternity, have never read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Henry Allen Ironside, the famous preacher, at a in a congregation that he was visiting and preach. He asked how many people had read through the Bible and so few hands went up that he um, kind of made a commitment never to ask that question and embarrass the people of the Lord ever again in a congregational setting. And, and so can you imagine if you're reading through God's word from Genesis to Revelation, God's totally downloaded all of his software, all of his word into your heart and mind through this year. You know, it takes about 15 or 20 minutes it's really no big deal. 
and then start, you know, just pray and, and just see what God will do. Well, if you want to hear from the Lord, that is. If you don't want to hear from the Lord, you just do what you're, you just keep doing what you're doing. So Numbers chapter 8 tells us in verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you arrange the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. And Aaron did so. He arranged the lamps to face toward the front of the lampstand, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, his, this workmanship of the lampstand was hammered gold. From its shaft to its flowers, it was hammered, a hammered work. According to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. First thing that, about the tabernacle as it's set up is the Lord specifically tells Aaron to arrange this. It's a seven-branch, it's called a candelabra. It has six or three branches on the outside and a center one. So it's seven um, candles or really oil lamps burning, not like a candle like we think of a candle. And as it's burning... Um, it's the only light inside of the holy place. There's the holy place, and that's where the priests would go in and do their, their daily business. And then there's the holy of holies where the high priest would only go in once a year. And so the holy place had no other light. They had no windows. That was just a Jesus moment when there's no other lights. It just went out. Hey, okay. When the Lord speaks, we better listen. So, so the darkness, that was a good illustration, right? So the darkness, if you would have just had a seven-branched oil lamp, um, it was to face a certain direction, okay? And so... The lampstand, everything about the tabernacle, and we're not going to go through it like we have before when we've looked at it in detail, but everything about the tabernacle points to, ultimately, a relationship with Jesus. Like, you can go through the, through, if you have the picture of the tabernacle, when you, if you're going to approach the Lord in a New Testament sense, the first thing you're going to come to is an altar, a bronze altar, where a sacrifice has to be made. And so we would look at that in a New Testament sense. You need to embrace the finished work of Jesus on the cross as the sacrifice right? And then, then after your salvation, then God wants to use you. And then there's this bronze. It was like a big bathtub, the bronze laver, and they had washed their feet and their hands in that before they served the Lord. You remember Jesus washed the disciples' feet and he said, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you, but you just need your feet washed, meaning that you've been cleansed. But when we live in this world, don't we get kind of mucked up from work and everything else in a daily way? We just need the Lord to wash our feet. And then, but we want to serve him. Then they would go into the holy place. And in that holy place was the table of showbread. It's the picture of God providing for us in our relationship with him. Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's prayer. Uh, Give us this day our daily bread. He provides for us. And then there's the table of incense, and they would put this incense on there. And as the incense would fill the uh, tabernacle with a sweet aroma, it's a picture of our prayers going up to the Lord. Because now that we're a saved people, a serving people, we're also a praying people that recognize God's provision. And then there's the candelabra. There's we're, Jesus is the light of the world. And then he's called us to be the light of the world. Jesus was the light that came into the world. And now we are to be the light of the world. And with our lifestyle, we are to, um, in our actions, people are to so see our good works that they glorify our Father in heaven. Let your light so shine that uh, they see your good works that they glorify our Father in heaven. And we're also salt, so that which we speak, speak, let your speech always be seasoned with salt, uh, Colossians 4, verse 6 or 8. And so um, everything we look at at the tabernacle, and then if you went into the holy place, there's the, the perfect law of God in the, the Ark of the Covenant. And it's the perfect law of God. So between me, a sinful man, and the perfect law, I've just came from the sacrifice, so I have the blood of the lamb on me, if you will. But then there's this mercy seat. And the mercy seat is that picture that between God's perfection and my sinfulness is this solid gold seat of mercy. You see, I approach God on the basis of mercy, not justice. I never pray, God, give me what I deserve, because I would just be like fried, right? Right? I deserve to go to hell. I've sinned, I've fallen, I'm not perfect. I'm never gonna be perfect this side of heaven, though God sanctifies me and cleanses me. And, and you're, at this side of heaven, you're never gonna, going to become sinless. 
But as I've grown in my walk with the Lord, I do sin less. I mean, there's a lot of things that God's dealt with in my life that are not there. And, and there's still, you know, those ongoing struggles that always, you know, Christians have or whatever you might be dealing with. But the thing is, is that then there's this mercy seat. Even the picture of the angels over the mercy seat that are like this, the angels are touching. And, and if you see the picture of it over the Ark of the Covenant, these angels are looking down. Peter tells us in uh, his letters that the angels earnestly desire to look into this thing called our salvation. Angels, I think, just don't get us. Because you see, the angels are not, you're not going to become an angel when you go to heaven. Angels are different. Angels have never fallen, the ones that are there. Demons are fallen angels, but they've never, they've never been redeemed by grace through the blood of the Lamb. So it's kind of a mind-blowing thing as they look at us in this whole salvation. I think angels must just say, why don't they pray more? Why don't they trust God? Don't they know he's big? You know, because they always behold who he is. Well, all of that is to say that this, the, the light in there is so important because there's no other light. Have you discovered, just like the lights just went out in here, it was pretty dark, right? But the light shines and is more noticeable the darker its atmosphere, right? In, in broad daylight, if I got a flashlight going like this, you can't see any of the results of the flashlight, right? But at nighttime, all of a sudden, this flashlight, even my, I have that little keychain chain flashlight, even at night, that, that seems like a big deal. And, but some of us are in pretty dark situations, and the Lord wants you, you to focus that light, and you're bummed out. You're like, oh, I just got to get out of this job. I find so many Christians, they get saved. They want to get out of their job right away. I got to get out. They're heathens, and I've been a heathen with them all these years, and I just got to get out. I said, don't you realize what God's done? He's saved your wretched hide to throw you right in that dark pit. You're the only bright spot now. You start singing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to let Satan it out. You know, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to put a basket over it. Let your light shine. People want to run from their family. They want to run from their dark place because you realize now that you're saved how dark it is and you want to get out. The Lord's like, hey, I want you to shine for Jesus right there. I just want you to be a Christian and let them know and let them watch for the next three years the transformation in your life so that your light just... But it's focused. That's what Aaron had to do. He had to focus that light. And it says that of the lampstand, that it was the workmanship. It says, now this workmanship, in verse 4, of the lampstand was hammered gold. You see, it reminds me of a New Testament passage that speaks once we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast, that tells us in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his, just what it says here, now this workmanship, but it says, now we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I know that by God's grace, he has prepared beforehand for me to walk in what I'm walking in and for you to walk in what you are walking in. You are his workmanship. The Greek word is poema, where we get our word poem. It means a work of art. You are God's beautiful workmanship. You are God's beautiful work of art. You're a poem. You're, you're a way of communication to this world that... Um, God can use your life to be, to be light. Now, Jesus in the New Testament in Revelation tells us that he walks among the candlesticks. And in that sense, it says that these seven churches, each one of them have an individual light that's burning. And um, the Lord warns that if they, um, they're not obedient to him, that he'll basically put out their lamp. Meaning it's kind of a heavy thing, but the Lord says, I would rather you shine bright for me and if you're not going to shine bright for me, but you're going to make a mess of things, I'm just going to close the doors on this church because you're not representing me correctly. The Lord would rather have a proper representation than a lousy representation. And he'd rather close the doors on a shop that is not really producing what the Lord wants him to, wants the congregation to produce. Well, the rest of this chapter is about the cleansing, the preparation, and the work and the ministry of the Levites. And we talked about that, the counting of them. They were given as a gift. Just to read a couple of verses for you, it says in verse 10, so you shall bring the Levites before the Lord and the children of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. Then down in verse 19, and I will, uh, excuse me, I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the work of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel, among the children of Israel, uh, 
come, when the children of Israel come near the sanctuary. So the Levites were to serve and help the priests. They camped around the tabernacle so that people didn't uh, very um, recklessly go into the holy things and around the house of the Lord. So to kind of be security, if you will, in a way to buffer that around there. Now in verse 23 of this, it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is what pertains to the Levites. From 25 years old and above, one may enter to perform service in the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And at the age of 50 years, they must cease performing this work and shall work no more. They may minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs, but they themselves shall do no work. Thus you shall do to the Levites uh, regarding their duties. Now this is kind of a cool setup. Now back in chapter um, 4, verse 30, it said that the Levites were to serve from 30 to 50. But here it says from 25 to 50. There are those, who, oh, that's a contradiction. No. They began to serve from 30 to 50, but they had a five-year apprenticeship to learn everything that they needed to learn. Apprenticeships are the way that old school people used to learn everything. They used to learn uh, electrical, they, and they still do to some regard, and, and uh, carpentry and all of this stuff. School or college is not the only place somebody can learn something. And so they would apprentice for five years, and then 30, they would be ready. Now at 50, they would have to, the, the men could stop doing that heavy, heavy lifting. And so really the sweet spot, their most productive years, think about it, from 30 to 50, you have more gumption, more energy to give. And then after 50, then we slow down a little bit. It's just like, well, I don't have quite what I had before. I, I think I'll work smarter, not harder. I think I'll, uh, <laughs> there's a, a lot of things that uh, you realize in that spot. And, you know, I realize just even in my, my energy level at 47, having started the church when I was 28, and uh, uh, just... Just that process and, and really at that 50 being able to look back and say, now I'd like to take a lot of young people. You, you see a couple of the young guys up here, Caleb and Buster and what the Lord's doing in their life and, and, and to be able to um, you know, have other young people like that raised up in the Lord. And then here's Dave Kirby, who's a great musician playing the bass over there and, and, and young people, be, him being able to mentor them in, in mu musical things. And it's just great when the older generation turns around and helps that generation. And, and in the church atmosphere, it should be that way. There should be, from the younger generation, there should be a, a respect as they look at those who are older and want to learn from them. And then from the older generation, uh, sometimes an older generation has a disdain for a younger generation. Oh, you know, this. And they get an attitude. No, you should turn around and be able to help them along. And so that's what happened with the Levites, get the rec next generation ready. You know, one, um, uh, <laughs> we were talking about this, way, uh, this week, one of these days, uh, I'm going to die. Maybe I'll die suddenly. And uh, you don't get 70 years. You don't get 80 years. You don't, I mean, you can't. Uh, death is an appointment. It's not an accident, no matter what happens. It's an appointment. It's on God's day planner, and I am not going to miss it, and you are not going to miss it. Even you people who are notoriously late, you are not going to miss your appointment. It's one you're going to make, and maybe the first one in many, many years, but you're going to make it. You're going to make that appointment, and it's going to be an aneurysm or a heart attack, or it's going to be cancer, or it's going to be leukemia, it's going to be car wreck, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, Michael, I, after talking about it this week, is just really realizing that we need to have a plan in our, our church. That, uh, uh, hey, what if I... Because I do fly an airplane, and a lot of people die in airplanes. And you don't always... Uh, if the engine's not running, it's not like you can pull over beside the side of the road like a car. So, uh, you know, just really thinking about that and processing that. Who's the young people coming up and uh, how can we put the, the ministry into their hands? Well, in chapter 9, we see the Passover. And the Passover is that, that remembrance that they celebrated a year and one month earlier when they came out of Egypt as the death angel passed over. And they, put, they killed the lamb and they put the blood on the two sides of the doorpost and over the lentil or over the header, over the top. And if anybody was in there that was a firstborn, they were protected. But if you didn't have blood over the, your door and you were the firstborn, then and you died of animal or a human. And so this became, and is to this day, to the Jews, a, a, um, a religious 
observation. And so now the Lord tells them to do it again. They did it back in Egypt. Now they're going to do it every year. Uh, It says in verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the 14th day of this month, at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all its rites and ceremonies, you shall keep it. So, okay, they get an exhortation to keep the Passover. All right, no big deal. But then they have a problem. They have a Passover dilemma. And it says, uh, as we get to it um, in verse 6, Now there were certain men who were defiled by a human corpse, so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron that day, and those men said to him, We became defiled by a human corpse. Why are we kept from presenting the offering of the Lord at its appointed time among the children of Israel? And Moses says in verse 8, Stand still that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. I like this. There were a number of times, actually three specific times, when they had been given God's instruction, they had been given the law, and yet some kind of a circumstance comes up that Moses doesn't know what to do. You ever have that in a daily way or a weekly way? Something comes up, you don't know what to do. And so um, they said, we want to observe the... Passover, you've just told us to observe the Passover, but we touch this human body, therefore they're unclean and they can't. What do we do? That's a great question. Now, some people try to bluff their way and act like they have an answer. Some people that struggle with having a kind of a know-it-all complex that you always have to have the answer, they just, they just rattle something. Peter had that problem. When he didn't know what to say, he just said something, and it usually didn't work out that well. But for uh, Moses, he's just, he says, you want, let's just stand, stand still. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord and see what the Lord will tell us. Let's just see what the Lord will tell us. Now, that happened also when an Israelite's woman, and he had an Egyptian father, they, they had a, this son, and he went out, and he was among the Israelites, and he got in a fight with a guy, another Israelite, and he, he cursed. He used the name of the Lord in vain in this fight. And so they brought him, you know, drug him to Moses, and it was one of the Ten Commandments, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So they drug him before Moses and said, well, the Lord told us not to take his name in vain, but what do we do when that happens? Was it, I don't know, let's seek the Lord. The Lord said, well, those who are witnesses, they need to uh, be the fa- first to cast a stone, and they ended up what, stone, stoning the kid for using the Lord's name in vain. Can you imagine if that, that was in play, play today? I mean, how much do you hear the people use the Lord's name in vain every week? This town community would be nothing but a big, gigantic rock pile. But they sought the mind of the Lord. That's what the Lord told them, so that's what they did. Also, uh, another situation where these daughters of Zaloa Fahad, the um, descendant of Manasseh, uh, all the boys had died, and usually the family plot or land, the family inheritance, only went through the the inheritance to the sons. But they had no... They had no sons. These daughters had no brothers. And so they said, is it right for our inheritance to go away? And they said, no. And each time they prayed, God talked to them. I want to encourage you. If you came here with a question in your heart, don't move ahead. Don't, don't just do something because you feel pressure. Just seek the Lord. And when he puts an answer in your heart, then pursue it. And until he gives you a clear answer, just wait. I heard a preacher at one time say, you just need to do something even if it's wrong. It was the stupidest thing I ever heard a preacher say. I said, that's so dumb. Do anything even if it's wrong? Why would you do that? Just pray and wait on the Lord. He'll make it clear. And sometimes you have to wait for a while. Sometimes people come up to me at church and they'll say, Pastor, we need to do this. Or what about that? Or what should we do in this circumstance? You know, I never thought about that. Well, let's pray about it. (laughs) So they call the next day. Did you pray about it? I wanted to answer it. You know, you just got to give us some time. Don't, if you feel like by pressure in me, somehow the answer is going to squirt out like a pumpkin seed, it, it, it's not going to happen that way. And, uh, you know, the more somebody pressures me, the, the less I want to respond anyway. So, uh, so Moses prays, and this is what 
they're told. They could eat it in the second month on the 14th day. And so uh, the Lord just worked it out. It's just an awesome thing. It says in verse 11, on the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones, speaking of the lamb. According to all the ordinance of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man who is clean and is not on a journey and ceases to keep the Passover, that same person shall be cut off from among his people because he did not bring the offering of the Lord at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. So if somebody, they don't have a reason they didn't keep the Passover, they just were very lazy about spiritual things, then he says they shall be cut off from the people. And in some circumstances, cut off means capital punishment. In some circumstances, it means they're just kind of an outcast. And so do you know that the New Testament version of Passover for you and I, when did Jesus give us the communion service? At Passover. It was Passover when Jesus took the bread and he took the cup. It was their Passover service. And so you and I, we get to celebrate Passover or, excuse me, a fulfillment of Passover, the finished work of Jesus, the Lamb of God that also did not have a bone broken, that was crucified for us. And we take communion and we remember the Lord and we do it on the first weekend of the month and we do it the third Wednesday night of the month and some churches do it every Sunday um, and we I mean we can do that too the thing is is that for me when it just becomes like it's a part of everything it just becomes really um kind of rote kind of not much reflection and so um just think about that um the Lord said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, because, because they were taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way, that many were sick and dying, that the Lord took it serious the way that they were approaching. So one person was drunk, another person was hungry, another person was acting gluttonous, there were divisions among the people, they were having this communion service, but it was just, it was a mess because people were just living so carnally, and the Lord said because they were not observing the communion in a worthy manner, and it doesn't mean that you know, we're unworthy. It means that the way that they were doing things, strife, uh, drunkenness, all this stuff, um, was really displeasing to the Lord. So the Lord began to chasten this church, and some of them were sick and dying because of the way they had approached the Lord's table. Well, that's pretty serious. You know, when we approach the Lord's table, we, we're looking back at the cross, and we're looking forward to his soon return, 1 Corinthians 11 says, and we're also to examine our own hearts. We're looking within. Am I right with God? Am I right with God? And there's times that a communion service comes and you, you know what, I'm not right with God. I'm not right with God, you say in your heart. And you just gotta, you gotta get right with God. So, well, the last part of chapter nine is about getting directions from the Lord. How are you getting directions? We live in a day of GPS and MapQuest. And if you're going to go somewhere, I mean, I, I put on in, you know, the, the starting point and the ending point and how many. I'm kind of an efficiency nut. I have this, like, idiosyncrasy because I just want it to be so efficient. How much is going to take the least amount of time, the least fuel? And, you know, I just, I just, uh, let's, neither here nor there. One of my uh, issues. So uh, I love to check that stuff out. So, but just think about the children of Israel. They wander in this wilderness, which this wilderness, it would only take 11 days to go from Egypt to Israel. 11 days walking. That's it. It's an 11-day walk to get to the promised land. But as we'll see when we get to chapter 13 and 14, that their unbelief keeps them in the wilderness for another 38 years. 38 years, 11 months, because we're at the second year, one month. So ultimately, this is really important. How do you get your direction from the Lord? How do you and I hear from the Lord? It tells us in verse 15, now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up, the day it was inaugurated, the day that, if you will, their Old, their old Testament tent, church, portable church went up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, from evening until morning, it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire. So when the sun comes up in the morning, this cloud, it's a pillar of cloud that is above the, the house of the Lord. That, that's pretty distinct, isn't it? That's better than a steeple with a little cross or anything. It's just a huge, it's a cloud by day. And it gave the children of Israel shade by day because they're in a hot desert. And then at night, as soon as the sun goes down, that pillar changes and now it's a pillar of fire. And so it could be, it, it lights their way. They can travel as it would go before him. It would so light up the night sky. They could travel by night when it was cool or by day and have that cloud. 
And this is how God chose to not only, um, I mean, I don't think they're having any debates in their camp that there's not a God. There's not an atheist in the camp. Look at the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. When we move, it moves in front of us. I mean, uh, God, God talks to Moses and Moses' face glows. I mean, the supernatural stuff. There's this manna all over the ground. And they came out one day and it's all over the ground and they said, what is it? That's what manna means. They just go, what is it? And it's stuck. So they had, what is it for breakfast, for lunch, and dinner? They had boiled manna. They had baked manna. They had, they had fried manna. They had manna cotti. They had manna, manna everything. And you know what? God, this supernatural God, was totally taking care of all of their needs. But he's going to direct them better than any GPS and female voice saying, turn right, turn right, recalculate, recalculate. They have a visible, tangible, as it would rise and it would move. It tells us in verse 16, so it was always, notice this, so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Always, consistency. For 40 years, this is what they had going on. From the inauguration of the tabernacle, this is what happened. Actually, we saw that a pillar of um, fire that actually went behind the children of Israel when they were coming out of Egypt. And it was a light to the children of Israel and it was darkness to the Egyptians. So the Lord could make it, you know, be light and dark both directions. It says in verse 17, whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that, the children of Israel would journey. So as soon as the, the, the clouds started moving, the children of Israel would journey. They'd have to fold up their tents. They've got tents. They've got to unpack. They've got to pull the stakes. They, uh, I mean, any of you, uh, most of us, have had tent camping experiences. And tents are great for two days. Maybe a week, okay? But 40 years of tent living and moving around. There's no KOA. There's no, there's no showers, so to speak. I mean, there is water, so the Lord's providing for them. But it tells us here... Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle in verse 17, after that the children of Israel would journey, and in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. So when it stopped, they stopped. When it moved, they moved. Now, that's what I call just great direction from the Lord, isn't it? I don't have to wonder. I don't have to wonder in my life if I should move because the pillar hasn't moved. I don't have to wonder in my life if, if I should stop moving because it keeps, it's, it continues to move. And at any given time in our lives, there are people here that are looking for decisions. You're looking for decisions. You're like, should I sell this house? Should I move over here? Should we downsize? The kids are out of the home. We've got this great big place. It's a lot of work, yada, yada. What should we do with this place? And so you start praying. You don't have a pillar of fire or a pillar of cloud to lead you. You go, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't it be awesome? It's, it's out there in the front yard. Every morning you wake up, it starts moving down the street, taking down 17th. You just have to follow it. People at work, hey, what you got going on with the pillar? I, don't, I just follow it everywhere I go. When it says stay, I stay. When it says go, I go. Wish I had a pillar. Be cool if I had a pillar. I want a pillar. I want you to know that here tonight as we kind of wrap things up, that you do have a God that will give you direction, but it is a direction that is going to increase your faith, meaning that God wants you. You have a, the Holy Spirit within you to help you. You have an open Bible, the Word of God in front of you to guide you, and you have our Savior, the Lord Jesus, Hebrews 7, uh, 7, 25 says, he's interceding for us. He ever lives to intercede for us. He's helping us in, in what needs to happen in our life, and he wants us to press in in prayer and to press in into the Word and press in in our trust in the Lord Jesus and him guiding and directing us and to figure this thing out because you don't know whether to quit that job or not, do you? You don't know whether to, to sell that house or not, do you? How do you know? How do you know? Inquiring minds want to know. How do you know? Well, as we see the lessons here, for them, they had something physical and tangible in front of them. As a matter of fact, it tells us in verse 18, at the command of the Lord, and it's going to say this three times, at the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey, and at the command of the Lord, they would camp. Those two phrases are going to be used 
a total of six times. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they re remained encamped. Even when the cloud, verse 19, continued long, oh, they stayed there a long time. When the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days, according to the command of the Lord, they would remain encamped. And, notice, according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only from evening until morning, when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they would journey, whether by day or by night, because they had to fire at night. Whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey, whether it was two days, a month, or a year, that the cloud remained above the tabernacle. The children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. And the, kind of the fifth and sixth time here. At the com command of the Lord, they remained encamped, and at the command of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So they had this experience. Now, the cloud would, at times, they would stay in a spot two days, a month, a year, maybe even longer. A long time for one camping spot with two to three million people. That's a lot of... Uh, a lot of people, just to move around with no KOA camps and various things, they had to obviously be in very wide, spread out uh, places. They would be spread out for miles. I mean, their camp would probably be 20 miles across, like a big metropolis, big city. And uh, they would have this experience. So for you and I, we don't have that pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night. So we, as I mentioned earlier, need to be reading the Word, need to be praying, and need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 tells us that it is God who works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. That means that by God's Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit within me. God begins to give me will, a will and a desire and an inclination. And it seems so natural to me because His Spirit's living inside of here. It seems so natural to me that I then have this struggle. Is this me just thinking about this move, or is this the Lord? Isn't that a challenge? That's a real challenge. So then I begin to analyze the, should I stay or should I go, right? So you begin to do the pros and the cons. The Bible says that there's safety in the, a multitude of counselors, so I start asking brothers and sisters, hey, what about this, and pray for us, and we're thinking about this. And so I have the Holy Spirit working inside of me, and he gives me desires and inclinations. When we came here to Idaho Falls, God had been stirring us inside to let go of where we were and to move on to where we're at. We had moved a lot before we got here. As a matter of fact, I have a disease of moving. I have moved so much in my life. And uh, primarily, it started when my mom married an ex-convict that we had moved about every six months. I would go to two schools a year, different school, you know, all the time. We'd move all over the place for about six years until he finally went to prison for a longer stint so he wasn't creating havoc in our life. He went to prison for a three and a half year stint for stabbing a guy a couple of times. And so we'd move all over. Well, when I got saved, then I began to have a new experience of God working inside of me and having new desires, and really wanting to pray and to read the Word. As I read God's Word, it's amazing to me how my daily reading, as I just read through the Bible every year, how my daily reading speaks to me about issues in my life. It's not like I'm, you know, flipping it open, closing my eyes, and putting my finger and hoping that that's some magical verse. But it's just through the consistent reading that the Word of God is speaking to me, and then He's put desires in my heart. And then Tammy and I, when it comes to moving, as a husband and wife, you have kind of a safety net. Because most husbands and wives are opposites. One of you is more talkative and outgoing. One of you is more introverted and quiet. That's just the way it usually works, right? One of you is adventuresome and, and uh, a, a bit, uh, we'll say adventuresome rather than reckless. And, and then some of us are really safety-oriented. You're just safety-oriented. You, you don't like any changes. Just got to be safe. Play it safe. Play it safe. Put the money in savings. Safe. And you, you don't want to take any risk. And so opposites attract. Now, if you're both saved, you have the beautiful 
built-in thing that if you're both praying about a move or a situation or a decision, you're coming from opposite ends of the spectrum as you're looking at it. One is saying, wouldn't that be fun? And the other one's saying, that is so totally scary. And so, you know, you, you sanctify that through prayer and through the Word of God. And as you're praying about it, if Tammy and I, when we're praying about a move, and we can get on the same page. We've never made a major move or a major decision. This is because I'm a, I'm a very uh, adventurous type. Notice I said adventurous rather than reckless. I'm a very, you know, get, I'm like a horse. I want to get out in front of God's will. If I even get a hint that there's excitement over that hill, then I'm going. That's the way I'm wired. But Tammy is uh, very methodical. She starts asking all the hard questions that are just a bummer for a reckless guy. Like, how will we eat? Will there be a roof over our head? Will the children live? She asks all that. I'm like, oh, those are all, those questions are all a drag because I have to answer them all. You know? Will we live? Will there be food? Is there, will there be money in the bank account? If, if this fails, what happens, right? You have to have somebody that at least asks the hard questions so that you're, uh, you know, you're not an optimist or a pessimist. You're just a realist. But what making decisions by faith rather than a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night, which is pretty much brainless, you just follow, right, is that I have to grow and I have to get close to Jesus to hear his heart. I have to read the Bible more and pray more and be more open and yielded and actually communicate more to the companion of my youth, my wife, to hear all the good and the bad and the ugly and everything around those decisions. You know, God has given us the safety in relationship. Now, if you're single, um, I mean, you can be led and you don't have to really worry about that other individual. And that's why Paul said that you're much freer as a single person. But about 95% of people are are called to be married. There, there's a very small percentage of people that are single people for a lifetime to serve the Lord. So I talk in generalities, but for the single person, they have nothing to lose. Even if they go and it's a total bust, so what? Whatever, they just go back to point A, right? It's no big deal. They don't have five kids in tow, a wife, uh, insurance needs, you know, all the stuff that's there. So if we're in prayer and we're in the word and what happens when we're pressed for a decision, we increase that. And as a matter of fact, we increase it sometimes in the place of fasting and praying. I actually stop eating because I want to hear God's heart so much. I don't want to make a mistake. You ever feel that way? Like I have some opportunities in front of me. And I want you to know the hardest thing for me is never, the hardest thing for me is never to go. That's the easiest thing for me. The hardest thing is to stay put in one spot and be fruitful. If it wasn't for God's grace keeping me in Idaho Falls, I'd be like a tumbleweed, just, oh, I'd go start this, and I would go do that, and I would go, I wouldn't stay anywhere. But every time I've prayed to ask the Lord, Lord, are you done with me in Idaho Falls? Can I go do something else? You got something? You know, let's go do something else. Yippee. The Lord goes, no. Okay. <laughs> Cloud's not moving. You know, it's just, <clears throat> just stand there. And there, there was a season in my life where I actually, because I've been here, this year will be 19 years, there was a season where I prayed a lot about going to do something else, starting another church, because I liked the excitement of starting things, but the maintaining of it, just day in to day out, is a, is a challenge. I don't know if you guys get, have the challenge of being bored, but I get challenged with being bored. And, um, uh, and so the Lord has to constantly just tell me no to keep my feet planted. And I'd press in and I would read God's word and I would pray and I would fast and pray and say, Lord, do you want me to do something else? Is the cloud moving? It was always the same answer. It's almost like it came back, you know, when you write a letter and then you know, they send it in return. I forget what you call that. Return to sender. It's just like the prayer goes, bang, bounces off. Like, don't ask anymore. You're not going anywhere. Figure out how to maintain. Figure out how to work through the boredom. Figure out how to do this. And what has happened through that, because I want to just exhort some of you that are wired like me, that some of you are restless and you want to go from thing to thing to thing to thing, and you never really are fruitful in one thing because you're always moving from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. I know people that move from job to job to job to job to job, but they never build anything for a long haul. They like the, the honeymoon phase, and then they want to go do something else. 
And you just never become fruitful that way. And uh, I know for me, I, we, you know, just the Lord, if I kept moving all the time, I wouldn't be able to see the fruit that I see from being the Lord nailing my feet to the ground in one spot. And for some of you, you're a person that God has been actually stirring to do something different. You're on the opposite end of the spectrum. And God wants to move you to do something, but you have hardening of the categories. You, you, uh, you don't do anything outside of safety. That's why your faith needs to grow. For the person that always moves or always is restless that way, faith to them is to stay put and to grow, press into the word, press into prayer, and have the peace of the Lord. And that's ultimately, Tammy and I, every major decision that's always, we have peace in it. We've prayed, we've studied the word, we've asked people, we've checked it out, we've spied it out, we've counted the cost, and her and I both say, hey, we have peace, let's go do this thing. And it's just supernatural. God has that peace in both of us. But if she doesn't have peace and I don't have peace, then we just never do it. We may never make that decision because the person with the lack of peace is actually God's safety valve in the marriage thing to keep you out of a mess. Now, having said all that, some of you might be sitting here tonight and you know what? You've made a mess recently through decisions. You really didn't wait on the Lord or you didn't listen to your spouse or you didn't listen to, I mean, if everybody pretty much is telling you you're making a bad decision, hello, you probably should wake up and listen. But you say, okay, I've made a bad decision. Uh, here I am. I'm doing what I'm not supposed to do. But now what do I do? Well, the Christian life is a series of new beginnings. Tonight you say, Jesus, I'm sorry I made a mess of things. I'm sorry that I, I found, I'm, I'm here and I don't know why, but I came to this church service tonight and I realized I've done the wrong thing. I've made the wrong decisions. I've, you know, I've devastated our savings. I've, I've had this strain in my marriage. I've done... And, and I've messed, the kids are in high school and I've drug them all the way over here and now I'm here and this wasn't your will. I don't know what I was thinking. Please forgive me. What's the Lord do? He says, you made your bed, you lie in it, you dog. Nah, 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 nah. No, that's not what God says. That's not who God is. God just says, okay, I forgive you. Now let's have a restart. Kind of like, when in doubt when your computer's messed up, reboot. Just reboot, you know, turn it off, turn it on. And then you walk the Lord, you just say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And the Christian life is a series of new beginnings. And the Lord just meets you in his grace right where he's at. And, and his plan was for you to go over here, but you diverted one over here. But you know what? His GPS still works over there. It's okay. He knows how to get you to where he wants you to be. I had a neat guy. His name was Tim. He was at our church. He was actually one of the early elders of our fellowship when we were on West Broadway. And Tim was a great guy. And he uh, got heavily involved with teaching our Sunday school. And he was a guy that he was just one of those stellar guys. He's a good elder. I just, I, w I just couldn't believe he wasn't more involved in some church before we came to town. And he really got involved. And one night on a Sunday night, we were, I was sharing a message like this. And he began to break down and cry. He's so upset. He left the church. I, I saw him crying. I didn't get to talk to him. And he came in that next week and made an appointment and said, I have to talk to you. And I said, what's up? He says, I'm in the wrong place. He said, five years ago, the Lord told me to quit my job and join this guy as an assistant pastor. And he would provide work for me. And I would just, you know, work and, and I'd be his assistant pastor. And I told him no. And I ran and I ran to Idaho. I got a good job making good money out at the site. He's an engineer. And he said, I just ran from the Lord. I didn't want to walk by faith. I didn't want to suffer. I didn't want to do what he wanted me to do. And he said, I've been hiding in Idaho Falls for five years from the will of the Lord. It reminded me of Jonah when he ran from the Lord and the big fish, you know, swallowed him up. And, uh, and I said, well, so now you know. What are you going to do now? And he says, well, I just went home broken and I just told Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do, Lord. And he said, the Lord gave me a kind of three-step plan, move here, apply at this company. And he got a job and get involved with this church. And just within a couple of months, boom, this Tim, who is a real asset to our fellowship, he had been hiding from God's will for five years. What a miserable place to be out, out of God's will. And he just went boom, boom, boom. And as soon as he broke and he surrendered to the Lord, God just set things up just bam, 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 and totally took care of him. Because that's your father. You know, if you see your kids get out of sorts, isn't it your heart? 
to see him do well? It's not like you tell him, oh, you know, you go eat worms for the rest of your life. You're like, oh, I'm so glad. you Now restart, get going in the right course, in the right direction. And our Heavenly Father is even better to us than that. May the Lord give you the clarity of his direction from his word, through prayer, by the leading of his Holy Spirit, that is much better and much more adventuresome walking by faith than walking with a pillar of fire by night or a cloud by day. May he bless his people with his direction by faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and kindness. Lord, we just uh, are so thankful that we can seek you. And I just pray for those who are in a transition spot. Lord, they're at a crossroads right now and, and they're just struggling with a decision. Right now, tonight, for whatever reason, Lord, you, for such a time as this, you've brought us to a point to look at this. As a matter of fact, as we're just in an attitude of prayer, if you're at a place that, you know what, you really need the Lord to give you some direction in your life, we want to join with you in prayer. Just stand up where you're at. We don't need to know any of the details. We don't know what kind of thing's going on, but we'll pray for you right now. I see you guys back there. God bless you. We'll pray for you. Love to just seek you, seek the Lord for you on your behalf. Wow, look at all these people looking for direction in their life. Praise the Lord. Lord, we've come to the right place. You see all these people, Lord, they're, they're standing just crying out and confessing, Lord, we need your direction. We need your heart. We need a clarity. Lord, would you just sweep away the fog? Would you write on our hearts what you want us to do? Would you show us to turn to the right or the left or to wait or to go or to uh, what steps, Lord, that... Lord, usually you just show us one step at a time. I pray that you would show all those who are standing, I pray that tonight that you would write on their heart that one step that you want them to take and then you'll reveal the second. Lord, it's just the way you work, one step at a time. So meet your people here tonight in Jesus' name, amen.